My name is David Radin. The name of the book that's being published is called A Temporary Affair. The book contains a series of talks that were recorded during a time when I was uh, in end stage renal failure. So the talks were mostly about insights that come up when you're tiptoeing around life and death. I, I also hold the name Yoshin, which was uh, a monk name that I was given by my teacher, Joshu Sasaki Roshi. And so the name Yoshin appears in the book and sometimes David appears in the book. But um, we're basically the same. To experience ease isn't something that one is able to do. If you are trying to experience ease, you can't experience ease, you'll just experience trying. But if you bring the mind to a state of accepting things as they are and, and a quiet state, then there's a natural ease that comes. And that ease is not affected by circumstances. So whether you're in the emergency room getting uh, intravenous uh, uh, blood pressure medication or whatever it was that would be happening there and walking around somewhere else in normal situation, the ease isn't affected by the circumstances. And for me, when I was in the challenging situ supposedly challenging situations that came up during the kidney failure, I, I would often be laughing or smiling because I hadn't anticipated how, how tranquil I would feel that there was no threat, there was no defense going on, no fear, no worry. I was just there and, and I think I mentioned in the book, um, I'm sure I mentioned in the book, that those moments are when the Dharma teachings, the true teachings about the nature of self and life, um, the grace that they give in life situations are just, uh, they just lead to a, a state of gratitude that's really unimaginable. Fundamentally, life has no meaning. Our, our stay in this human world is a temporary affair. And so to take one's accomplishments or one's failure seriously is to lose touch with the meaninglessness of your life. But that meaninglessness exposes the meaning too. The, the meaning is, the meaning of life is what you are, what we are. That is the meaning. The meaning is that our true nature is visiting earth through us. That's, that's the meaning. The meaning is the visit. The meaning is what we are. It, it's not something that is um, generated by accomplishments or circumstances or anything like that. The meaning is what we are. And that meaning is a, a very humble state to the ego. And, um, You become a, a beacon, a, a beacon to me, a beacon means to be an empty vessel through which the true light of being shines. And the, the radiance that you have in that state is not ego-based. It's, it's just a humble awe.
to know what you're doing isn't an activity of thinking. It's an activity of awareness. So that when you're walking, people aren't aware that they're walking. They don't know what they're doing. People know what they're thinking, but they don't realize that they are experiencing. When people are seeing, they don't realize that they are seeing. They don't know that they are seeing. They know the objects of sight, but they don't know that they are seeing. I mean, don't know what they're doing. In other words, a person who is walking down the street is usually not aware that they're walking down the street. A person who is walking down the street is usually filled with 10,000 thoughts and concerns and it doesn't know what they're doing. They just know what they're thinking. But this capacity to know an object is a divine power. It is a divinely given. It is the source of existence, the knowing. How it is that we can experience objects is a, an activity only performed by the divine. The human world performs thinking and thinks that it's living. It thinks that it is existing as a true existence, but it's not. The spiritual path is to awaken by direct experience to awaken that the body is an experienced object. So that, that when your body is experienced object, you know what you're doing when you're doing it. You're aware of what you're doing. So for example, if you're doing Zen meditation, breathing in, I am aware of breathing in, or I am the awareness of breathing in. And breathing out, I am the awareness of breathing out. And th this is to introduce the consciousness to being the witness of the physical, ac physical body, physical activity of the body. But people don't know that. It, most people, it can take 30 years before they can experience one in-breath. <laughs> because the mind is so busy. <laughs> But that, that's what I mean by when I say people don't know what they're doing. It's not that, oh, you should have gone to Yale instead of someplace else. You didn't know what you were doing by going there. Or you, you, you should have gone to Italy instead of spending your time in the Catskills. Uh, it's not like that. It's very direct. Uh, when you blow your nose, you, be aware that you're blowing your nose. And in that awareness of blowing your nose, you will feel the grace of God as the awareness of the blowing of the nose, that which allows the blowing of the nose to be experienced. Oh, oh, divine, that's the nature of the divinity. It's, it's really yes and no. Um, if I can digress for a minute, in Zen, there's a school of sudden enlightenment, and then there's a school of gradual enlightenment, where you practice and you gain wisdom, or you have a completely sudden insight into the wisdom. So it's a little bit like that. I tend to be less, I don't mean to boast but less stupid <laughs> than I used to be. I mean, I mean, I don't know if it's because of my practice or from just growing old, but no. Um, you, 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 you create less suffering for yourself after a while. And but the insight is always fresh and new. It's never something that ages. All, all the aging and this and that, that takes place in the physical form. But the, the illumination itself has no time to it. So for example, if I'm sitting in meditation and breathing, you know, 
a mind could be running all over the place. Mm. But then a moment, the mind quiets down and then your mind, <clears throat> the teachings or the insight comes, comes conceptually into your mind. Oh, I am that which is illuminating you sitting here and breathing. Conceptual insight happens like that. I am aware uh, that I am sitting here, and that David is sitting here breathing. And, and then that extends to, I am aware that my nature is the awareness of David sitting here. Yeah, that has no time to it. That, that it's not like I've done it a thousand times, so I don't, whenever it arises, it's a pure present. So, in a way, <clears throat> the practice, yeah, makes it more possible to be available for it. And in a way, no, because everything that I do is useless in that regard. <laughs> There's nothing I can do to produce that state, you know, if you know what I mean. It's only stillness quiet mind, resting of the mind is the only state in which the Buddha mind or the transcendent nature of mind uh, reveals itself. It's very valuable to have mementos. Um, you can say that the whole of Buddhism originated from a memento. The, the original Gautama Buddha saw a corpse on the ground. He was about to be, a, he was a prince about to be king. And seeing the corpse for the first time when he was 29 years old because of being pampered by his family for, it's a long story, but he sees the corpse on the ground and he can no longer integrate being prince and king because how, it'll help, how will it help him cope with that experience which every being must have. So he goes back to the temple, takes off all his robes, cuts, his off, cuts off his hair and wanders as a beggar in pursuit of whether there is something that transcends death in the human form. That's essentially the start of the Buddhist religion. And <clears throat> Uh, sitting in a meditation posture is a memento mori. Did I get that right? <laughs> memento mori. Sitting in the, in the meditation posture is offering your body as a corpse. You're seeing into the corpse-like nature of your body by the body becoming the object of awareness, breathing in. Oh, now I'm experiencing body as an object, breathing out. Hmm. Now I experience body as an object. So every time you go to a meditation hall, it can be referred to as a mini death. Then the physical body itself, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of diseases. <laughs> And d diseases walk you near the edge of death, you know, a little bit. And when you're at the edge of death, you see that you, you feel more deeply the undying element within. When the mind is busy with external objects, you don't realize what's going on inside, how you are structured, how you are ontologically structured. So I was fortunate. Any time something happens to you, to us, any time something happens to us in life that we can't really handle, it's a memento mori that life is not structured about satisfying our desires. Well, life is what it is, and that, that is our correct posture in life. Mm. But I don't usually carry around with me little objects like 
you know, beads or things like that. I should carry around a little silver kidney <laughs> at my hand. Yeah, oh yeah, oh, nice, nice kidney. <laughs> when you look at the origins of a religion, it's always been a prophet who walked to the edge of death and came back and said, there is a deathless element within us. I can witness to it. To be the witness of the deathless element is the gospel or the testament or the New Testament. Someone came and gave a new testimony to the existence of the deathless. And most of them, you know, they fasted 40 days, 40 nights, drank, didn't eat, didn't drink. Moses, Jesus, others. People think of it as in terms of punishing the body or something like that, but it's not. The purpose of that kind of practice is to, to walk, walk voluntarily into a near-death experience. Not, not for the purpose of giving you a big YouTube following, <laughs> but for the purpose of knowing that it's okay to die. Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What does it set you free from? It sets you free from the fear of death. So that's what all those teachings were. All religions, basically. To be separate from everything means that you're identifying yourself as residing within the body and experiencing an objective world. It's a conceptual reality. That's what it's based on. I am David, and I am experiencing an objective world that is separate from me. Once I take up a stance inside that I am this individual, the foundation that that identity stands on is the fear of death. It's not something that happens to it. It's what it is. To be an individual is to be the fear of death. It's a package deal because everything, every individually existing thing is subject to decay, old age, and death. It's not escapable. It's just the nature of things. It's like every, every, uh, every, Banana <laughs> is subject to decay and death. Every, everything. The world of forms is constantly changing. The reason that the, the liberation from fear is called awakening is because the mind, the very same mind that says, I am David, that mind re-identifies itself. The awakening is the mind awakens from identifying its location as being inside the body. And it realizes that its true location is as the experiencer of the body. Another way to say that it realizes that birth is death and death is birth or resurrection mm. to 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 be born as an individual is to stand in the fear of death to die is to realize that the fear of death was a concept created by the mind that had been identifying itself as a physical form and in truth there is no fear of death because the essence is deathless that's why I say when people bring themselves together or sit in meditation and meditate on the experience of the body being an object. Yeah. Early, early on in my life is like a precursor to re truly entering spiritual life, but using drugs in that kind of way as part of a search for 
a reality that I, I knew had to be, but I didn't know anything about it whatsoever. And, and the experience came of total terror. And then I, I lay down because I was so shaky. I, I couldn't do anything. I just lay down and lo and behold, I was seeing the body lying on the ground and the self that was seeing the body on the ground says, you finally found it. This is the truth. That, that experience, it's left me quite a bit, but it, it really provides inspiration in many times. I would suggest if you're reading the book, instead of just continuing and reading it, try, try to recreate the experience that's being described or recreate the view that's being described and digest it. I'm just describing to you um, the conditions for being alive. Um, Buddha said everybody is structured the same way. That's why I can teach, teach the Dharma. And it's same. You, you are structured in a way that you may not have properly conceived up until now. And now this book is an invitation to examine whether yourself really resides inside the body whether you're prepared or contented to go through life standing on the foundation of knowing that death is inevitable and still continue to make a fuss about your personal life, to really be courageous enough to examine how should I truly live. And the book can provide you with maybe a few words of encouragement or maybe they can point in how exactly this whole thing works. But if someone just reads it and puts it down for a moment and realizes that the thing that's talking in the head, the actual thing that's talking inside you as thought, that thing is your identity. It is your existence. That is what your existence is. And it is luminous and it is transpersonal or impersonal. And it is with you every moment of your life as that which is knowing you, that which is experiencing you. But the mind falls from the Garden of Eden or the mind falls into the conceptual identity that is placed inside the body. I think three or four people mentioned that, oh, I, I keep it by my bedside. So that when you, you know, you're looking to bring the mind into a quiet state for going to sleep and you read something, it puts a smile on your face before you lay your head down. 